Former Governor John Hickenlooper jumped onto the national stage in his bid for the White House during a town hall on CNN. Well, he fielded an early question about capital punishment. What's your position on the death penalty? So I'm against it. It makes no sense. It's not a deterrent. It's expensive. It, it prolongs misery. And the worst thing is it is random. Depending on where that Governor Hickenlooper is one of 14 Democrats who have announced they are seeking the 2020 nomination. More could still join. And among those considering a run, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett. Bennett staffers tell us he could make an announcement about, oh, in the next coming weeks. Of course, Bennett would be joining a crowded field, as we said, of candidates, including Hickenlooper. And this had us wondering what the rest of the country thinks about Bennett's chances. Well, we checked the odds in Vegas and found he's not even listed. And before you say, maybe that's because he hasn't announced yet. Well, we found that The Rock, Tom Brady, and Leonardo DiCaprio haven't either. And Vegas has odds on them. Go figure. Now, there are two new members to Colorado's congressional delegation in D.C. right now. Joe Nagus, who was elected to replace Governor Polis in the 2nd District, and Jason Crow, who won the 6th District seat that had been held by Republican Mike Kaufman for a decade. And we are pleased to have Congressman Crow with us here today. So thank you for being here. We want to start with the fact that you and Congressman Nagus moved out to D.C. and you were... Roommates of sorts? <laughs> yeah. How's that working? <laughs> yeah, well, good to be back with you, Anne. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, we are roommates. You know, Joe and I have known each other for a long time, well over a decade. We actually were interns together uh, when we were in law school and then uh, practiced law together for a number of years. And it's, it's really good to have somebody in D.C. that you know and you trust and you count as a friend. So uh, it's, it's great that we're uh, rooming together. Now, you've said it's been three months, but it feels like three years, so this has been a, a lot of work for you. You've been involved with the Bipartisan Background Checks Act, mm -hmm. which passed the House. Why is that bill important to you? Well, this is something I've been talking about for several years, and I campaigned on. And, you know, I'm somebody who keeps my promises, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm following up and following through with my promises from the last few years. You know, I, I'm a father. Uh, I'm, I'm a combat veteran. I grew up a hunter and a sportsman, but we have a public health crisis in our nation. We have, we're losing over 30,000 Americans a year uh, to this crisis. You know, we need to pass common sense gun violence prevention lo legislation laws to save lives, and that's what we're looking to do. That's what this bill does, is follow through to save lives, and it's time that the, that the Senate joins us in leading uh, on these common sense measures. Do you support New Zealand's immediate ban on all assault weapons? Well, New Zealand has a different system than we have, right? We have to go through a process, and uh, there's a legislative process and hearings uh, that, that we have to go through. I do support starting that process and, and going through and having those hearings about assault weapons. I've been very clear that I don't think that the same weapons of war that I carried in Iraq and Afghanistan should be the, should be on our streets and uh, in our schools. You know, these weapons have been used to inflict massive casualties, you know, all the way from Aurora to Columbine to Las Vegas to Newtown. Uh, they're, they're killing an awful lot of people, and I think we have to start the process of having the hearings and passing the common sense laws to, to save lives. I know immigration has been an important topic for you as well, and I know you're co-sponsoring the Dream and Promise Act. Do you see that yeah. moving forward? I do. You know, th this is this is one of the biggest moral issues of our time. You know, the fact that we have young kids you know, that uh, they're just as American as as we are. These are kids that know nothing but our country and their community. And these kids are fearing deportation to a country that they don't even know. You know, we owe it to these children to provide safety and security and stability to them and a pathway to citizenship. We've got to get this done. I, I know that. We spoke before you were elected and you said your top priorities were health care. You also said corruption and campaign finance reform yeah. were, were yeah. two very important topics right. for you. Have you done anything yet? What, what's your plan to, to address those issues? Yeah, so I was one of the lead sponsors and pushed very hard in the first few months of this new Congress to pass what was called H.R. 1 which is a comprehensive campaign finance, ethics, and voting rights reform package. Because, you know, the last couple of years, something really struck out to me, or stuck out to me, and that was you know, everywhere I go, whether I was talking to Democrats or Republicans or unaffiliated, people just said they, they've lost trust in the system that none of it matters to them anymore, that they all feel like people are being captured by big money and mega donors and lobbyists. And that really hit me hard because I thought about you know, the apathy and the disconnection that I saw when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I was seeing that, that same level of mistrust and, and disenchantment with the system, you know, on the streets of Aurora and Littleton and Centennial, and I vowed to do something about it. So I, I pushed through this reform package. Uh, the Senate needs to take it up and push it through as well because we need to restore trust between the American people and elected officials, and I'm going to keep pushing for that. And on the health care front? 
you know, we're doing a lot of things to reduce the cost of health care. You know, this is a big pocketbook issue. You look at prescription drugs, the price of prescription drugs have gone up uh, way too fast, too high. Yes. I mean, it's a huge part of people's sure. budget now. And we can do things right away to start reducing the cost. The biggest one is it's time for the federal government to be allowed to negotiate with big pharmaceutical mm. companies to reduce the cost of these drugs. Because, you know, American consumers, people in our district, are paying three times as much the exact same drugs that they're paying in Canada and Europe, and it's just because we're not allowing the federal government, Medicare, and others to negotiate with those companies. Well, and, and the state legislature is, is looking at allowing us to import drugs from Canada. What do you think of that? Well, there's the issue of importation mm -hmm. and generics and, and pricing transparency. I think all of, all of the options need to be on the table to deliver immediate relief for American families. You know, if you're paying $500, $600 a month for life-saving drugs, drugs that you need, to survive and to have quality of life, you know, that's way too much. And, and that this is something we can do. There's a lot of options on generics and foreign imports that could cut that number in half or even two thirds and really help people a lot. Uh, what do you think of Colorado's new law in the Electoral College and favoring the popular vote? Well, I, I think we have to look at that. You know, I haven't uh, fully assessed the, the, the new law in, in Colorado and in the efforts at the State House here, but, you know, there is this issue that uh, the popular vote doesn't necessarily decide uh, who's, in, who's uh, in the White House, right? You know, uh, we ha had an election just two years ago where the person who over overwhelmingly won the popular vote, uh, you know, did not win the election. So we do have to look at uh, the right way to go. But you're not ready to uh, support that? I'm in a listening mode on that. I, I want to get out in the community and I want to see what people have to say. I hold a lot of town halls uh, and I, and I want to hear what's on people's mind. Are, are you surviving this uh, this this freshman? Um, uh, yeah, this time as a freshman. Yeah, it's, no, it's a we, tumultuous <laughs> time in Washington. It's been several <laughs> decades since I've been called a freshman, yes. but uh, I, I guess uh, I guess it's true. Uh, no, we we're surviving. You know, we're having uh, uh, you know great. We, we're in a great opportunity for this country right now. Yeah, you know, look at this class being a part of this freshman class. You know, on January third of this year, uh, a quarter of Congress was new. Right. And what's amazing about this class is not just its size, but you look at who we are as well. We're generally not career politicians. You know, folks like me, you know, who are parents, veterans, business owners, people that were running nonprofits that said this system is not working. This is this is not what you know what we can and should have. Our country can do better. We're all stepping up and it, this is an amazing class to be a part of. And it's fascinating to watch what's happening in Washington right now. So thank you so yeah. much Jason Crow for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks Anne. Thank you. Listen, if you ever have a question or a segment idea, tweet us at Denver 7 Politics and you can watch today's segments anytime at the denverchannel.com slash politics unplugged. We thank you so much for joining us. We will see you back here next Sunday for another edition of Politics Unplugged.